very good evening. I am Surmi Rasya Saleem, Faculty Coordinator, AAC Student Chapter, Manipal, Dubai Campus. It's wonderful to have all of you here with us today for the highly anticipated tech talk of the School of Engineering and IT. Through the School of Engineering and IT's tech talk series, our goal is to invite experienced professionals from the industry to deliver talks that are idea focused and provide the upcoming engineers an insight into the broader industry ahead and to foster learning and inspiration. This tech talk being organized by the AAC student chapter, it's our immense pleasure to have Mr. William F. Baker with us today to speak on the topic Burj Khalifa and the design of tall buildings all the way from Chicago, Illinois. Now, let me introduce Mr. Baker. William Baker is a structural engineering design partner for the architectural engineering firm Skidmore Owings and Merrill LLP. His work spans a wide array of structural engineering projects, ranging from small pavilions to the world's tallest structure, the Burj Khalifa. One of the focuses of his research and design is the optimization of structural and architectural geometry to minimize the embodied carbon of buildings. He has honorary professorship in structural engineering design with the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge, where his research and lectures focus on design and on adapting the contributions of Rankine, Airy, Maxwell, and Michel to structural optimization and modern structural design. Baker's honors include being a member of the National Academy of Engineering, an international fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, the gold medal from the Institution of Structural Engineers, the Fritz Leon Hart Praise Germany, the Gustav Magnus gold medal from the University of Ghent, the Fazl Rahman Khan medal from the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, and the American Society of Civil Engineers Outstanding Projects and Leaders Lifetime Award for Design. He has received honorary doctorates in engineering from the University of Stuttgart, Harriet Watt University, Illinois Institute of Technology, and the University of Missouri. That's a brief outline of Mr. Baker's profile. Now I request Dr. Jason Fitzman, Academic President, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, Dubai Campus, to address the gathering and welcome Mr. Baker. Please, sir. Thank you very much, Samaya, and, uh, and welcome everyone to the uh, fourth Tech Talk, and tonight's on the Burj Khalifa and the design of tall buildings. And uh, one of the things we've always tried to do at Manipal is to work closely with industry and try to give students that uh, real world experience from getting involved in, in, in what's happening in the, the, the real world there. And I think tonight's a, a, a very special night. And I, I, I think uh, I'd like to welcome Bill to, to give the, the, the presentation tonight. It, it's indeed an, an honor to have someone of your caliber to, to come and give us a, a talk and uh, share your, your experience in, in the real world. And I think it would uh, be a great inspiration to, to students and faculty alike uh, to see what you've achieved in, in your own career there. And uh, I hear that you're in Chicago, one of my favorite US cities there, and time difference. We have all the technology, but there's not much we can do about the time differences. So I'm, I'm sure it's uh, early morning over there, and I uh, really appreciate you being able to, to, to do that and come on, come and give us a talk there. And I think it's a, a quite an impressive resume. When you think about uh, the Burj Khalifa, it certainly put Dubai and the United Arab Emirates well and truly on the, the global map. And I think that it's quite an achievement to have it on your own CV. It's a great personal achievement, uh, an achievement for your organization. And I think that uh, what we'd like to do is, is welcome you to, to, to share your experiences and uh, I'll hand over to you. Well, well, well uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, 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 this, to give this, uh, this presentation. Uh, and, and, and one of the things I want to point out is that uh, I noticed that this is sponsored by the uh, student chapter of the American Society of Civil Engineering. I think it's very, very important for all engineers to be active in the professional societies, you know, uh, both uh, uh, local societies and, and national and international societies. Uh, you know, to, to push our profession forward, it takes active involvement of, of, of individuals. You know, and if you go into, if you go into practice, uh, you know, try to be active uh, in your profession. You'll, uh, 
you can uh, you can help others and you'll you'll learn things yourself. So I'm very pleased to do this for the for the student chapter of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to talk about uh, the Burj Khalifa and the design of tall buildings. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, you, you can hear me clearly. If, if not, just uh, let me know and I'll, I can put on a headset if I need to. Uh, now, it, when, you, when you talk about tall buildings, you know, they're, they're definitely part of our culture. Uh, you know, there, there's always been the desire to go high. I mean, uh, if, you're, you know, you, you always, if you're in the hills, you want to climb the mountain. You want to go see, see, what, see what's on the top. Uh, you know, it's part part of our culture. Going back to the Tower of Babel, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's central to to who we are. Uh, you know, we we have this desire also just not only to go high, but to stand, stand over the abyss. These are uh, uh, these are these glass boxes that uh, that hang off the, the edge of the uh, the uh, uh, Willis Tower. It used to be called the Sears Tower, but where you're you know a good 300 meters above above the pavement, uh, and uh, you know, and skyscrapers, were, uh, there's some some debate about what is the, the world's first skyscraper. But for the moment, let me use the home insurance building as an example. What makes it up uh, a skyscraper? There's two fundamental things, and these also apply to the Burj Khalifa. The, the, uh, it, this was the first steel frame building. So the structural system and the elevators, the vertical transportation, as you, as you call them, the lifts, okay? Uh, and, and so... Uh, you know, on, 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 the, um, on the home insurance, it was a steel skeletal uh, frame. And then for the lifts, it was, you know, uh, Eliza Otis uh, developed the, the safety elevator where you could cut the cables and people, and, and it made it safe enough that people were willing to have it as the primary mean of getting up and down the building. And, and, and I have to say that uh, structure and vertical transportation are still the key components of, of tall buildings. Uh, you know, and and the, and the change in tall buildings, you know, it went fairly uh, rapidly uh, from the home insurance building to like the to the MetLife building in New York, and, and until we get to the to the Burj Khalifa, uh, basically 100 years after the MetLife building. So there's been you know a, a quite a run up in, in the height, uh, though <clears throat> there was a the, the big there was a bigger uh, change from the late 19th century to the to about 100 years ago the the, the uh, the uh, 1920s and 30s, uh, it, principally in New York, there was a great hot run up in height. And then uh, the, um, the, the, the increase in the height of the world's tallest building was somewhat incremental for, for, for quite a bit year, years. And there's this, all these debates about whether or not you count, you count the, uh, the thing on the top. Is it part of the architecture or, or is it an antenna? And depending on, on how the buildings are designed, sometimes they're counted, sometimes they're not. But you can see it was a fairly steady uh, uh, range for the rural solace. But until you get to the Burj Khalifa, uh, where the change in height was more than a 60% increase. Um, and and as, since it's a student uh, uh, presentation, I want to uh, bring three uh, technical issues to you. Uh, one is uh, first, the, a, a concept of a tall building, it's a giant beam coming out of the ground. Conceptually, this is very, very important. And because if you think of it as thousands of elements, like, you know, these little columns and these spanner beams and floor beams, it's too complex. Our brains are not able to deal with, with, with that information and you, you cannot do the design. So, uh, you know, quite frankly, I do most of my preliminary designs with a, uh, on, on paper, with a HP calculator, uh, a pencil and an eraser, okay? Uh, and, and, I, and you can design the world's tallest building with, with, with just those tools, okay? In the end, you're gonna put in the computer uh, to, to verify things and see if you missed something and get, or get additional insights, but the fundamental about our concepts it should be in your head. Uh, and let's let's talk about beams. So let's go back to the first structural theorist, which is Galileo. Uh, I would consider him the first modern structural theorist. Uh, you know, in his in his dialogues of uh, 1638, he talks about the cantilever beam, and uh, he gets it not quite right. He didn't he didn't figure out the neutral axis, but but he he got enough that he got the the concepts right. So here we have a cantilever beam that's got coming out of this remnant of a masonry wall, and and. Uh, so let's let's take that idea to a tall building. Let's take a cantilever beam 
and turn it vertically. And, and, and just like on a cannon remain, you push on it, it deflects. On a tall building, you push on it laterally, it deflects. And, and when we think of these tall buildings, we think of them very much in, this, in, the, in the context of a beam. Uh, in a beam, you'll have um, the flanges, which take the overturning moment. You have the webs that connect the flanges and handle the shear. And, and you know, in an I-beam, it looks like something we're very uh, used to see. In a building, it might, it might look like an I-beam, or it might, it might look like a box or, or the like. And, and when I think about, um, when if I go back in our archives, when uh, Dr. Foster Khan and Hal Angar, um, who used to be my bosses at Skidmore here, uh, you know, we're, um, uh, we're working on the design of the Sears Tower. Uh, here, I found this in our archive. Here, here's a picture of the building in elevation, the plan view. And this is a plot of the moment of inertia of the entire building. And furthermore, you know, it's a step function, but they, they approximate it with this, this linear um, uh, approximation. And actually, you can get pretty close to the actual behavior of the Sears Tower just by using uh, the, the, the simple principle of calculating the moment of inertia. And if you go down to the bottom of the Sears Tower or the Willis Tower, uh, you know, um, uh, Foscon and, and Hal Angar called it the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the bundle too. For me, it's actually a big box beam with four webs. Uh, and and here, here are the stresses at the base of the, of the tower. And with the wind going in this direction, you can see you have a uh, tension stresses along this edge. You have compressive stresses along the other edge. Uh, you have uh, plane sections do not exactly remain plane. You know, about 30% uh, of the deformations of the Sears Tower is due to shear deformations. And, and about 70% is due to a pure flexual uh, uh, deformations. Uh, but, it, but it's acting very much uh, like a beam. Uh, the, the second concept I want to throw out there is, is, is the importance of wind in tall buildings. Uh, here on the left, you see this computer animation of, 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 uh, of fluid, in this case air, going past an object. And it goes back by in a very irregular manner, first to one side and then the other. And, and, and on the right, you see a, a picture of, of the John Hancock Tower here in Chicago. And, and if you look, you can see a vortex forming uh, in the cloud as it goes past the top of the building. Uh, this picture was actually taken by uh, a scholar from Northwestern University. She's actually a Shakespearean scholar, but she got this great, great photo that I was able to get a hold of. And, and, you can, and, and as these vortices appear, they will cause a pressure differential across the tower, which will cause it to move from side to side. And, and, and this happens in a very rhythmic pulse, just like a child on a swing. And so um, as you do that, you, you, you know, the child moves higher and higher because they're matching the natural, the, the, the natural resonant frequency of the swing. And this, this is the tall building problem. And, and it happens not only at the scale of tall buildings, it happens at the scale of a street lamp. Uh, here you see uh, the, the street lamps, they're, they're, they're kind of going wild. The wind is not going very fast. It's just a very steady wind in the wrong direction. And you have this, this, this harmonics. In fact, if a tall building were ever to fall over in the wind, it would probably fall over sideways. And because of that, uh, you know, uh, we do a great deal of uh, wind tunnel testing. This is actually a wind tunnel we have in our own office. And, and that we use for uh, uh, competitions and preliminary design. Uh, when we, uh, towards the end of the building, we'll go to a commercial wind tunnel for the, for the final design loads, such as uh, RWDI that we use for the Burj Khalifa or, or other uh, uh, international quality wind tunnels. Uh, the third issue I want to uh, uh, have you think about when I talk about, I'm gonna talk, pro, uh, talk about tall buildings, primarily the Burj Khalifa is issues of scale. This is very, very important. And this was actually recognized by Galileo in, in his, uh, his uh, dialogues of uh, 1638. It turns out, uh, for a long time, I thought this was drawn incorrectly. So here's a bone, this bone, the big bone is three times as long and, and I think nine times as wide. But it turns out if you had a pure cantilever where, where, where you're limited by the stresses and the stresses are related to the weight of the, the, of the bone, I, um, this is actually the correct proportion. So it's interesting, I just sit, sit there, I give yourself an assignment, I do the math. 
uh, on, a, on a cantilever with a circular cross section and with a, a given stress and you make it three times as long, see how much deeper you have to be to have the same stress. Uh, another important uh, reference is this book, Growth and Form, which I urge you all to look at. Uh, it was done by a biologist, uh, Darcy Winthrop Thompson, uh, uh, which is basically, he, um, he wrote it during World War I and revised it during World War II, but, it, but it's basically uh, a lot of things in nature look like they do because of physics. And, and in many ways, tall buildings should are, are also creatures of nature that should respond to the physics of their environment. And now, uh, Galileo's uh, 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 rules don't, didn't, weren't quite accurate for, for bone structure because it's not just a bending issue, it's also axial. Uh, but, it, but certainly if you, if you look at the, uh, at the, the scale of a, of a small mammal to, to, the, uh, to a tall, um, uh, large mammal, uh, you know, certainly you see you know, uh, you know, changes uh, in proportions. And at some point, you just can't make it any bigger. Uh, that, that, that issues of scale don't apply. Uh, if I were twice as tall, if, imagine me twice as tall, and I'd be twice as wide, and I'd be twice as thick. And how much would I weigh? Eight times as much. So you know, you know, things go bad fast. And, and so, if I were to take the Sears Tower or the Willis Tower and scale it up to be as tall as the Burj Khalifa, it would be too big. Uh, you'd be too far for the, for, too far off the windows, too much floor area. It just you don't take you, you know you don't take this and scale it up. Whereas the, the Burj Khalifa scales by the square rather than the cube. And it's through this understanding of, of scale that we were I think we were successful in our design. Because if I were to make the Burj Khalifa twice as tall, I'd have twice as many levels, and I would have to make the legs longer. Let's say twice as long, but I do not have to make the legs any wider. And because of that. Uh, you know, it scales by the square rather than the cube. And this was an essential component of the success of the Burj Khalifa. Uh, and, and so the, this is a, a diagram that Fazer Khan saw, started years ago uh, with his uh, partner, um, you know, my, my former boss, Heil Angar. And, um, you know, and he, you know, so he made this little like uh, charts of buildings, but I really consider it species. This is like you're going to a natural science museum and you're looking at different species of different tall buildings. And as you get, as the, as the, the problem changes in scale, you need new species. And unlike nature where generally, you know, one creature evolves from another creature to another creature, uh, in architecture, you can create completely new species. As long as you're, you're creative and, and you respect the, respect the physics of the problem. The, um, and so uh, 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 here's uh, some models we have of, of several of our buildings where we modeled only the structure. And, and in these species, in these creatures, one of the things I think it's important to achieve as architects and engineers is that the architecture and engineer is so in, engineering is so integrated that it's, say you pull the skin off the building, the architecture does not go away. They're the same. Uh, you cannot describe the structure without describing the architecture. You cannot describe the architecture without describing the structure. So uh, let me uh, lead you through uh, the Burj Khalifa, uh, which uh, for many, many years we called the Burj Dubai, as you know. Uh, for, for, for us, it's, uh, the project started March for Saturday, March 1st, 2003. Uh, I and a couple of my colleagues flew to New York City to meet with some people from this place called Dubai. Uh, to uh, about the, uh, uh, some project, and um, and it was decided that we were that, that uh, by the client Imar, uh, who uh, by the way uh, the head of Imar Mohammed Alibar is one of the most hardworking people I've ever met. Uh, he, he's just you know an amazing amazing person and a great client. Anyway, so uh, the um, uh, uh, so uh, the, we, we had a, a really quick uh, short competition. And uh, we had just finished a tower in, in Korea, uh, which uh, was at one time 90 stories. It later got a haircut down to 73 stories, but it was its Y-shaped building and it had a, a, a different system, not what we use in the Burj Khalifa, but this is the system we started with. It was a basically kind of like a bundled uh, boxed core, if you will. And, and, um, 
and uh, you know, this is not the system we ended up with the British Cleveland, but this is where we started. And so uh, this is what we won the competition with in the spring 2003. And then, uh, 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 so, uh, so, uh, so we started out with, uh, the, the brief was to have the world's tallest building. At the time, the world's tallest building was the Taipei 101. And so we were uh, just, um, you know, uh, 10 meters taller than Taipei 101, which would have been the world's tallest building. But we, it quickly uh, grew to uh, 200, uh, 725 meters. And then after it was already construction, it, it grew to 828 meters. And I'll talk a little bit about how, how we were able to achieve that. How big is that? I mean, you guys live with it, so you're, but it's actually, it's pretty big. Okay, uh, you know, it's interesting to see in the context of other locations, this is what it would look like in Chicago or in, uh, in, um, in downtown in New York or uh, Midtown in New York or in Washington, D.C. We call this, you know, we call this, you know, maybe the, the, the Burge, D.C. Um, uh, uh, here's what it would look like in the uh, financial center of, of London, uh, of the city or out by Canary Wharf in London. Um, here's what it looked like in Paris, but I don't think you should ever put it next to the, um, uh, uh, next to the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower should stand by itself, but it would look pretty good in a lot of fonts, I think, uh, if, if one decided to, to build it in Paris. Uh, of course, uh, here's what you guys are used to looking at uh, as it looks in Dubai. Uh, the area in the tower is, is roughly 280,000 square meters, about 3,000, 3 million square feet which is big, but not that big. Uh, the, um, the World Trade Center towers that went down in New York, the ones that came down on 9-11, each tower had, had 4 million square feet. Uh, the, uh, the Sears Tower, the Willis Tower, has 4.4 million square feet. So, so in, in that sense, uh, the tower is, 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 in area sense, is a big building, but it's not that big. And that's important. That's actually a good thing. Uh, because that makes it uh, more easy to market. Uh, you know, the, the investment is more controlled as far as cost. And I think that's one of the reasons the building was actually built. Now, down at the base, there's a lot of other things going on, so, uh, parking and, and, and the like. So this is not including the mall or the other stuff. This is just at the base of the tower. And so the total project is in, on the order of uh, 465,000 square meters. I'll walk you through the building. I'm sure, I'm sure you know it pretty well. At the base, we have these fairly large floor plates, um, uh, you know, to, to handle parking and other things. And then we uh, we get into the Armani Hotel, uh, and then uh, above the, uh, uh, the Armani Hotel. By, by the way, of course, let me give you a little look at the floor plate. The floor plate is this Y-shaped uh, building, and, and what's and what's remarkable is the views are great. If you go to the World Trade Center towers that went down, the columns were every meter and the windows were only half a meter wide. And so it was like you're in a cage. Um, on the, on the uh, Sears Tower, it was, you know, the, the, the windows are like three meters wide and the columns are about a meter and a half wide. So you, you're about, um, so you're, you're on the, you know, you're about two thirds window and one third opaque. Here, um, these, these columns are on the order of 600 to 700 millimeters thick and the spacing is nine meters. So you have tremendous views. Uh, and as, you, as you're there and you're looking out, it's, it's not like you're in, you may, be on, you may be in the world's tallest building, but you're not, your views are not, are not obstructed. Uh, you know, so um, above the Armani Hotel, we have the, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, service residential. And then we have the uh, more residential, the floor plates are changing as we go up, as they get, they get smaller. You know, they, they, the wings step in uh, one at a time, A wing, B wing, C, C wing, we, in a clockwise manner. Uh, and then above there, we have the, um, uh, you know, the luxury residential. <laughs> now, uh, EMAR, uh, <laughs> they, they were able to sell, uh, this is just totally amazing, uh, the, uh, the yellow, the brown, and the blue in two nights, in 2004, okay? And everybody who bought a, a unit had to put up 50% of the purchase price within, within six months. And so that, that went, a, went a great deal towards uh, financing the tower. Uh, one of the interesting things, when you're in a pure office building, uh, your financial model is quite different because you have to build the entire building, get some tenants, 
and then wait for your rent check, okay? And, and so whereas here, you know, with the purchasers, you know, your, your, your cash flow situation is much different and that, that's, that's fairly important, okay? Um, so the, uh, anyway, so the, you know, the floor plates uh, continue to get smaller. And then at the, at the very top, we have these uh, corporate suites, uh, which of course now uh, recently, a lot of them have been converted into additional uh, observation decks, uh, including the chairman's suite. Uh, but you know, at first these were supposed to be uh, res purely residential palaces in the sky, but fairly late in the game, uh, uh, Mohammed Alibar decided that, that these he could do better if these were uh, boutique offices for, as you guys know, uh, Dubai is the financial center of that whole region. And so if, you know, everybody from in the region has an office in Dubai to do business. And so if you're very prestigious, you can have your offices in the, in the, in the Burj Khalifa. Anyway, um, so the, um, the floor plates are getting a bit small. Uh, and then uh, you, you have to have these mechanical systems of floors. Uh, uh, you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot service all your, uh, all your mechanical and electrical functions from the base. The water pressures would be enormous. If you had a, one, one pipe that went from the top to the bottom with, with, with water pressure. And the other thing, you, you, your, your transformers, you cannot, uh, if you, uh, you cannot take low voltage that high without, without too much loss. So what we do is uh, we divide the building into, from a mechanical, electrical, and plumbing point of view, we divide it into a series of shorter buildings, say 30 to 40 stories. And this is very common in tall buildings. So that, uh, and, and that's where you, you get your air to, to bring in to, for your services. You have your transformers, you have your, your, your pumps and the like. So uh, you're, you're able to, to use normal pressures, normal voltage drops uh, within, within these zones. Another interesting thing to be, and I don't know if you've done this, but it, it's interesting like in the summertime is to uh, be down at the base of the tower and then go up to one of the high terraces and feel the climate change. I remember during the construction, we used to go up on the outside of the building in the, in the man hoist. And I remember going up in July, and you know how it's, it is in Dubai in July, you know, it's pretty hot, pretty humid. Uh, and by the time we got up to about the 50th floor, you'd start to notice the climate change. And by the time you got up to 160, it was pleasant, uh, you know, and so it was, you know, it was, and so our mechanical and electrical, our, sorry, our mechanical engineers took advantage of this. We called it sky source sustainability. They actually captured, they took advantage of the, uh, of the cooler and, and drier air up high for their intakes at the top of each of these zones. The, uh, uh, you know, as I said, structure and, um, and vertical transportation are, are key aspects. So I'll give you a little map of, of the, of the, uh, vertical transportation. And uh, what it is, um, the, um, you have a series of, um, for, for the bottom zone, it's like a normal building where you, you go and you take an, a lift to your, your individual floor. Uh, for these upper zones, what you do is you kind of take like an express elevator, we call it, uh, we call it an express lift. And then you get, it, it's like taking an express train from one major city to another major city. And then you get in the local train to take you to your village. And so that's how it works. You have these express uh, lifts that take you to, um, uh, to, to a sky lobby and then you get in your local and, and it goes very fast. Uh, it, it's interesting for the, uh, for the top zone, we actually go up to the middle of the zone and then you get, you get in your locals so either to take you down or they take you up. Now at the time when the, we, we did the Burj uh, Dubai, as was called at the time, Burj Khalifa, uh, the, uh, the highest you, you, know, you could ever go on, on, a, on a lift was half a kilometer. And, and so, uh, so that is what we, we, we did here. And so th this, this gray bar is the, is, the, is the freight elevator, the service lift, and it goes up half a kilometer. And then you have to change into a, a local to get, to get to the very top. Uh, nowadays, they, they've come up with um, a new technology using Kevlar. Um, cables instead of instead of steel cables that they could actually actually uh, they can they can go a kilometer or more, okay. Uh, you know, certainly the uh, fire safety is very important, 
And so uh, people, can, if, they're, if they come, go down the stairs, they, they can do it in these uh, 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 protected uh, stair stairwells. There's, there's multiple stairwells. Uh, I, I've never climbed all the way up, but I've climbed down. I remember uh, when it was under construction, I had one of the engineers give me a little chart of all the, uh, all the link beams, the highest stress. So I was looking for cracks. At the time, there hadn't been any big windstorms, so I could not, couldn't find any cracks. Uh, well, but I, I, uh, you know, I walked down. It took me a, a while, uh, but you know, it wasn't too bad. My, my calves hurt the next day. Uh, but you know, coming down, it's not too bad, but we don't expect people to come all the way down. Uh, we, we have areas of refuge uh, uh, several times down the tower where someone could get out of the stairwell, take a rest, and then continue the, the, their, their trip down. Uh, we also have something called um, uh, lifeboat um, elevators. So uh, people can, uh, with the permission of the fire marshal, you can take some, some of the elevators can take you down even, the, even if the building uh, has, a, has an emergency event going on. Okay, so uh, what make this possible? Uh, number one, good luck. Okay, uh, the, the right place at the right time with the right client. <laughs> okay, uh, but but let me keep it. Let me keep it to the technical side. Okay, um, uh, so what made this possible? Structural uh, systems, uh, the wind engineering, the integrations of systems, and the construction technology. And so, uh, as you as you probably well know, it's primarily a reinforced concrete building with a steel uh, with the top it transitions to steel for for the for the spire. Uh, you know, it, it's composed of, 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 of simple systems, you know, uh, walls, slabs, and a few columns. And if I were doing it again, I wouldn't even have the columns. I just have walls and slabs. Um, and and uh, this is the, um, the, the structural system. Uh, as, as designers, as you go, as you go into work, I, I, uh, you, you need to be in control of the design. If your boss asks you how the structural system will work and you have to go, um, you have to go query the computer, you're not in control. You need to be telling the, com the computer how the system works. Okay, and you need to be driving the design. And, 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 if, and if someone asks you to describe your design and it takes lots of words, maybe you're not there yet. Uh, you know, you know, what you need to do is you need to distill your ideas down to their essence. And, and Foss Kahn did this. I don't know if he did it intentionally or just you know, innately. You know, the, uh, the John Hancock is a braced tube. Two words, not an adjective. The Sears Tower is a bundled tube. Two words, not an adjective. And, and, and you don't want to do this too early because you don't know where you're going when you start design. Design is very nonlinear. But at a certain point, when you think you're close, you think you're there, try to describe what you've done in words. And if it takes a lot of words, you're probably not done. If you get it to a few words, that's good, like maybe a sentence. Sometimes you can get to two words. And, 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 and so the essence of this building is a buttressed core. So the core, this hexagonal concrete wall system in the middle is very important for torsion. You do not want to have a tall building twist. So that, this acts like a giant axle that keeps the building from, from twisting. But it's too slender to go to much height. I think it's like 11.6 meters from the center to the, one of these cross walls. Uh, anyway, so, so what we do is we buttress it by, by these kind of like parts of an I-beam going, going down the, the, the three wings. You, you know, just like an I-beam has a web and flanges, this has web and, and cross flanges. Uh, in the three directions. And if, if the wind blows against two of these, if wind pressure against two of these wings, the third wing will be the buttress to, to resist those forces. And, and, and this, has a, this acts like a giant beam. We actually calculated the radius of gyration of the entire building uh, as part of the design process. And, and this man represents the lateral system of the Burj Khalifa. Uh, he, he's resisting wind against the umbrella. His front leg is like this, this core and his back leg is the buttress. So th this is the lateral system for the Burj Khalifa. Now, uh, one of the most important things you need to do in a tall building is manage gravity. Gravity is very reliable. 
you can count on it. You know, it's uh, you don't have, you know you don't worry about the inspector for not being there that day or anything like that. They will you know the gravity will be there, but you need to put the gravity where you want it. So uh, what we did a lot is we 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 this is from the core to the perimeter. We pushed the, the gravity outward, and in the process, uh, you, you know, we, we had to do a lot of uh, we had to we had to push that, that that gravity across these link beams. In order, in order to get it out there, so we did. Uh, we did a lot of uh, research with the University of Illinois. Uh, did, did, did some studies, and we had three kinds of link beams: normal, reinforced concrete, and then uh, with uh, with a encased uh, steel plate, or, or maybe a, a very large encased one. And for each of these, uh, we did we did a series of studies. Sometimes we could just use strut and tie, and that that would get us uh, pretty far. Sometimes you could just use the, the normal equations. But you know, usually we had to go to strut and tie. And on the right, you can see the capacity we had. And, and you know, or should I say, this is the, the red line is the demand. And these curves are the capacities. And then uh, uh, we put in a plate. Once again, here, here's the demand, here are the capacities. And sometimes we put in a really big plate. Okay, and once again, uh, the demand and the capacities. But, but what we thought it was very important. Uh, nowadays, uh, th there are there are like codified rules on how much to embed the steel plate, and so uh, at the time there were not. So we were doing you know, fundamental research to come up with these these values. Um, the um, um, anyway, so what, what it is? Uh, this is what the, the this is what the, the the rebar looks like at the bottom of the Burj Khalifa. If you were to walk up to that as an engineer or an architect, and you look at that rebar. And someone asked you, well, how, how tall do you think this building is? What would you say, five stories, 10 stories? You probably wouldn't say 160 stories, 160 plus stories. Um, but, but the Burj Khalifa has no tension. Even in a, if the, even in a storm that happens once every 1,700 years. That's because we, we manage both the wind, but, but also manage the gravity. Uh, we use this amazing material, which we call reinforced concrete. We should probably come up with a new name. Uh, you know, uh, at the time, you know, Dubai has really good concrete, by the way, uh, compared to many places in the world. Uh, part of it has to do is because the corrosive uh, soils there. So that, that you know, the you know, the the, the the way to beat that was to have a high quality concrete. And and so uh, you know, we designed it um, uh, for kind of the highest strength concrete that was kind of available at the time, like a C80. Uh, though you know the 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 supplier generally delivered at least C100, very high modulus, so really good stuff. Uh, it, you know, it's like I say, it's 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 not like the stuff that's down on the sidewalks for sure. Uh, you know, we were very concerned about creep and shrinkage, and so we actually controlled the surface volume ratio and the mixed designs of all the vertical elements so that they were all within a very narrow range. Uh, you know, we, we calculate how much the <coughs> The uh, building change dimension, uh, like this is level 147. This shows the creep and shrinking study. At the very top, we had, uh, had the steel spire where this uh, triangular system set on the hexagonal core. At, at the very bottom, we have this uh, foundation system uh, of piles. You notice what most of the piles are outboard, not in the middle. Uh, and and we're, we're, we're in this, these piles are a meter and a half long, about 45 meters uh, uh, deep. They have uh, around, uh, uh, I think it's 194 piles. I have to count them again. Uh, the settlements are very small, about 50 millimeters, only that much. The width of two thumbs, uh, that, that's, that's how much uh, the, building, the building settled. Uh, you know, we're sitting on, on you guys have a, a, a sedimentary rock called uh, Calci Siltite. Which is, in my mind, it's like uh, sandstone, but instead of sand, it's silt. Uh, it's uh, it's seashell sea, sea silt. It's a calcium silt. And it's pretty good material. And occasionally, it'll have a gesiferous so, uh, void zone, but we didn't we didn't have that problem. Uh, you know, where, where you might um, you might have some voids, but there were no voids. Uh, let's go back to the wind engineering that we talked about before in the harmonic resonance. And so we did a tremendous amount of wind tunnel studies. The minute we won the competition, we went into the wind tunnel. 
Uh, we had to figure out what the what the wind climate was in uh, Dubai. There wasn't as much data today as we had uh, by then as you have today. So uh, working with RWDI, they made what we call a super, uh, a super station where they took the, the wind data from several airports in the region and made like a, a pseudo uh, super station. And then they did a very sophisticated uh, studies to figure out what the velocity profile is as you get higher and higher. Uh, we, we did a whole series of wind tunnel studies and um, uh, with, with various configurations and various structural systems. And what we came out of, the, the building has six principal directions. Um, when the wind blows into the nose, it's pretty benign. The nose acts like a cut water and the vortex that's forming forms downstream. So it doesn't really push against the building. But when the wind blows between, between two of the wings, we call that the kind of the tail direction, a vortex will form and blow against the third wing. And, and that was of some concern. And so what did we do? We reshaped them. And actually, you know, the, uh, the, the first shape we tested the wind tunnel did not work. It had very big forces and very, um, uh, very big motions. And so what we did is, you know, uh, if you've ever read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, it, it says, the, the, the guide says in bold letters, don't panic, okay? So as engineers, when you have a problem, don't panic. It will not help you. Work the problem like an engineer. Figure out what the problem is and work it and try to keep, keep calm. And so what we did is we reshaped the building. So every time you change the shape of the building, the rate of the vortices is changing. And so remember that the child in the swing with two feet that are uh, kicking her in harmonics? Uh, the Burj Khalifa essentially has 27 feet. And they're all kicking at different rates. So the swing doesn't go anywhere. The, the, the harmonic action is barely uh, activated. And so uh, this red line represents a 100-year storm. And so uh, this, our first shape was like, these are the six directions. By the time we had reshaped it, uh, um, uh, you know, twice from one tunnel study one to one tunnel study three, the forces had dropped my little bar moved a little bit from here down to there. And all of a sudden we could go much higher. And, and so, uh, so here, here are the, um, some of the wind tunnel models. We have both air elastic and, and what we call uh, force density. Um, this is the first model, this is intermediate. This is the one we built. We actually taught, tested one that was taller that did pretty well, but it was too late to, to accommodate it. We then tuned the building. We tuned, we tuned the, the harmonics of the building like a musical instrument. We play with the mode shapes, which directions it, it shakes, what's the front of all mode shapes, uh, what's the period and what's the shape of the mode shapes. And, and, and we had very, very good uh, 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 dynamic behavior. And, uh, and then the air, air elastic models, which actually uh, model the, the actual structural harmonics uh, uh, ex uh, with the, this milled bar. And, and here's what we found. So here, here is the one for right after the competition. Base moment, let's consult that force. Acceleration, how much movement is done. By the time we finished the building, even though the building grew by 310 meters, the change in height is, is essentially the height of the Eiffel Tower. The change in height equal the Eiffel Tower, the base forces were less and the motions were less. What's really strange, this other one which we didn't build was actually even better but there was a hot spot around the 40th floor and we'd already, we, we'd already gone past the fourth floor. So we, we didn't avail ourselves. Of, we weren't able to avail ourselves of this. Uh, one of the things that came out, uh, you know, uh, as engineers, uh, you, 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 you'll get exposed to, to scaling and it's limited, it's called. And, uh, and as you go from uh, in the wind tunnel with the tall building, you can scale everything but the air. You can scale the geometry, the harmonics, but you cannot scale the air. And, uh, but if you're, if you're in a turbulent range, it shouldn't make any difference. So these are the wind speeds, um, uh, the model wind speeds. And as we change in meters per second, and, it, and what we did is we, as we changed the wind speeds, it went down and then suddenly stabilized, which indicated we might have a problem, an issue with uh, what we call Reynolds number. And so we, we did this model uh, up in Canada at the uh, at the, um, the the National Wind Tunnel in Ottawa, 
and it's a pretty big model. Okay, <laughs> uh, it's it's, you know, it, it's a it's a nine meter high wind tunnel, and so we did this test just to see if we had a Reynolds number problem. Uh, th th these buildings are Swiss watches, okay? Everything matters. And so uh, th this is the core. Uh, this is the, we have a, the most shafts we have at any, it has 54 lifts, but the most openings for elevated, for lifts we ever have is, is 19, because uh, there's double deckers and, and the sky lobbies and stuff. And, and everything has to be precisely oriented. Uh, and so the architects and engineers go back and forth. It took us weeks or months to, to get this right. Uh, with the uh, the architects and engineers proposing and counter proposing, um, you know how to lay out the core, and so you you have all all these pipes that have to get through the structure, so you have to provide holes for them, and so if you want to design a tall building, number one have a clear structural idea. Do not try to make a bad idea work. Okay, so you got to have a rational system. You got to think about proportions and scale. Uh, you know, we owe it to our, our society to be efficient in the use of our materials. Uh, you know, you, you got to manage wind and gravity. And m perhaps most important in really tall buildings, is it's got to be simple and fast to construct. You got to have at least one idea how to build it. Uh, my, my boss, Hal Angery, used to always say, you know, don't propose a design unless you have at least one idea how to build it. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be a construction expert, but you, you can talk to some of your buddies. <clears throat> who go into construction management or something say, I got this idea, how, how am I might have built it, okay? And kind of, and, you know, they're usually, you know, uh, you know, buy them a cup of coffee and they'll, then maybe they'll help you out, okay? Um, and so, um, you know, so this is what we had. Um, here's our, our pile load tests, your typical 6,000 ton, which is not typical at all, 6,000 ton pile load tests. We never failed a pile, so we really don't know how strong our piles are. We know they're at least 6,000 tons, okay? Uh, you, uh, in Dubai, you have very, very corrosive groundwater. So we did uh, cathodic protection on the foundations. Uh, we, uh, we did our test cubes here, 3.7 meter test cubes, where we, uh, we tested, def def this is for the foundations. We were looking out for heat of hydration issues. You do not want to have your, your concrete cure so quickly that you, that you change the chemistry. If you start to boil these things because the heat, you got problems. And so you have to have a, a mix that will, and of course, they always want to, no matter what, they always end up doing these massive pours in the middle of the summer. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you, 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 gotta, you gotta take that on head on. Uh, we poured uh, the uh, foundations in, in these four segments. Um, there, there's the rebar cage. Uh, there's the concrete of the, of the mat. And then it sat there for a while. For, for those of you guys who uh, know Dubai, uh, <laughs> the neighborhood's changed a little bit, okay? Look at that. It's all desert, okay? Uh, you, 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 you go to debt, you go there, you know, it's, you know, you, you recognize some of the buildings, they, they, you know, they're up the coast, but, you know. Anyway, so um, it sat there. So the foundations were done ahead of time by another construction team. And then it sat there while, while uh, Imar and Mohammed Alibar negotiated with, uh, I think we had seven bidders uh, for it because we used very conventional construction technology. Uh, and this was on purpose. We knew we were going to do the world's tallest building and, and we needed to do it with, with structural systems that were familiar to contractors. And so we had seven valid uh, proposals, tenders for the project. Anyway, uh, so eventually uh, a team was selected. First thing they did is they tried to figure out how are you going to pump uh, concrete uh, uh, 600 meters in the air? And I was saying, well, how are you going to do that? Are you going to go to a mountain or something? No, what they did is they, they used um, um, hydraulics, uh, Hardy Cross. Uh, and, and they figured out how they figured out by how many bends and, and going back and forth across the desert floor will you get a pressure loss, which is equal to pumping vertically 600 meters, and they, they tried various concrete mixes and, 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 and they looked to see what came out the other end was still concrete or not. And, and eventually I came up with a concrete mix so they could pump 600 meters. So here's what it looked like when, the, when Samsung, uh, Airtech, and B6 uh, showed up on the site in, in 2005. And then it goes off to, to the races. It's like a vertical factory. 
the the uh, the formwork raises itself the concrete is pumped the only thing that has to come up on the hook for the structure is the rebar cage um, the, the the walls and the slabs can be raised independently that's very important for speed and 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 uh, you know the, the wings were left the, the tips with the columns were left behind because they took too long and, and it went up the uh, the original cladding uh, supplier went bankrupt a Swiss group and then later they, they brought in a, a group from Far East Aluminum to, to do the skin and, and it went up and up uh, the, the, they uh, we couldn't get a crane high enough to build a spire from the outside so it was built on the inside of the building so th this is the bottom of it we had this kind of like a I call it like a lazy Susan at the bottom where it was a triangular opening going up to the tower and then this base you you get to the place and you rotate it 60 degrees and set it back down uh, anyway so so here it is hanging on strand jack down, down in the building and uh, it was you know uh, launched out the top uh, we, we even put blades on the top of the spire if you look close you see these blades that's to break up the vortex shedding on the spire itself of course, there's a light up there. I understand Tom, Tom Cruise changes the light for them. I'm not sure about that. Uh, the um, that's a joke. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so there, you, there you can see see the very top. It is the uh, it, it is the lightning rod for your entire city. Okay, I'm sure you, you've all seen it hit, hit by by lightning. Of course, it's completely grounded. It's a, it's a giant Faraday cage from your physics or electrical engineering class. So lightning can never get into the building because it's a Faraday cage and, and, and it's grounded. So it, it, it does no damage. Uh, there was was finished before they washed it. Uh, you're certainly above the clouds occasionally. And then they washed it and it looked beautiful. You know, just amazing. And all that brightness you see is light not going into the building. It's actually a hexagonal. So there's no more than one sixth of the building that's ever directly in the sunlight. All the other five faces are, are, are opaque to the wind. And then you have the, these, uh, these uh, bright mullions which reflect the light. And, and, the, and, the, and the glass itself has a, what's called a low E coating that, uh, that lets in light, but keeps the infrared uh, light out. The heat keeps the heat out. Of course, you, uh, I mean, you, you get to see it. I don't get to see I haven't seen it since um, a couple of months before the pandemic. So I haven't seen it like you know, almost a, a year, not quite a year and a quarter or something. You know, it's, it's incredible. The way it catches the light, um, you, you know, of course, then we had the grand opening, uh, you know, on uh, not quite uh, 11 years ago. It was, uh, it was uh, uh, Independence Day. Uh, January 4th, uh, 2010 was the grand opening. Uh, they announced the height was a big secret and they changed the name from uh, Burj Dubai to Burj Khalifa, which was a big secret. No one knew that, you know. No one knew the name, uh, that the name had changed. It was always called the Burj Dubai. No one knew the name had changed or the actual height until boom. So this is the instant that it was announced. They had the, the fireworks, uh, you know, just totally amazing. It was it was a it was a nice it was a nice event. Uh, 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 as architects and engineers who go in the design, we don't actually build the buildings; we do the drawings. These are the people who build the buildings. It, it was it was uh, Samsung Construction. Uh, KJ Kim he he led the thing. So the number one guy was from Korea. The number two guy was from he's right actually right there behind him was from Belgium. The number three guy was from Korea. The number four guy was from, from Belgium. And then Arab Tech provided uh, uh, most of the labor. And then uh, th this is, uh, he was from the owner's rep side. Uh, this is, uh, um, yeah, uh, I think, uh, what's his name? I think he was on the uh, on the, the local inspection side and he was from Turner, who was on the owner's rep side. And, um, and this is my back, okay. Uh, anyway, so, so you know, th these, were the, these were the main players on the structural side. Uh, let me, uh, I'm running out of time, but let me say uh, briefly, why super tall? You know, Dubai is the reason, okay? And that we are in this area of super tall. Th these are the buildings taller than 200 meters of the last century. 
this century, last century, this century. We're in the era of the tall building. Uh, you know, and every year, you know, there, there, there's some very tall buildings built. Uh, th these are the buildings that my, my firm has done we think, that we think will be completed in the next few years that are all over 300 meters tall. Yeah. And you know, I feel a little embarrassed talking about this to this crowd, but the, you know, the Burge effect is a big deal, okay, uh, around the world. You know, there's that desert. I, th this is my last time in Dubai, like uh, November uh, yeah, 2019, I guess it was. Um, uh, this is the last time I was, you know, I haven't traveled for a year now. Um, anyway, so I, I, I took these photographs as, as the night went down. I, I was over there, I did a little uh, thing with Richard Hammond from the Top Gear thing where we kind of rode dune bugs across the desert and tried to explain why that care, why that matters. Anyway, uh, so there, uh, okay. And then the shows, you know, the people, the crowds, the, uh, you know, the, the fountains, the music, you know, you know, and the light shows, just totally amazing, you know. Uh, when you think about what this building has done for Dubai, the UAE, and for the world, it's just quite amazing. So, thank you. I'll thank you, Mr. To... Baker. That was really wonderful. So now the forum is open for discussion. So students and participants, kindly type your questions in the chat box or please raise your hands for asking questions. Yeah, and I have a little, um, I'll, I'll turn off the, uh, I'll, I'll stop sharing for a moment. Um, but if you could help me monitor the chat box because uh, sometimes I don't keep up with it very well. So at the below, uh, you can find chat. I'd love to hear from you guys. Too. I'd love to hear from uh, those of you in sure. Dubai uh, if you have any any experiences or things like that. Like whenever I go to the Willis Tower, I always talk to the tenants and ask them, "Well, oh, you know, how's it going?" You know. <laughs> and so, if you, if you have any 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 stories, or if you think of something late, later, just drop drop me a note. But, but you know it's always you know the, you know the Burj is is instrumented, uh, it's heavily instrumented, uh, you know so Samsung uh, you know took the lead on that, and uh, it, you know, and it, and it's a very sophisticated operation there. Um, there uh, particularly on the uh, you know it's almost uh, the way they're they're they're, they're monitoring and, and managing their mechanical systems and their elevating systems and their electrical systems and their. Plumbing system is very, very sophisticated. Yeah. Um, yeah, hello. Uh, you can hear me? Yes. Yes, so I'm an architect and faculty at the School of Design and Architecture. Thank you for a very, very uh, insightful and amazing session. And um, I would just like to say Burj Khalifa is my favorite building and for many others. Uh, as you started saying that concept, wind, and scales are the three major issues for any tall building. And architects always conceptualize and design buildings. And we often credit the design of buildings to the architects. And engineers always um, complain about it. But the role of engineering in this mega structure is amazing. And uh, I would like to ask you that, was there any conflict or any design changes or challenges that the architects had to do because of the engineering um, uh, barriers or challenges that were there during the process? Well, I mean, it's an interesting question. You know, um, my firm's a little, uh, uh, is an integrated firm where we have architects, uh, you, know, we, you know, so Skidmore and Merrill. Skidmore was an architect, Owings was an architect, Merrill was an engineer. And so, you know, you know we're, we're an architectural engineering firm. We have, you know, urban planners, interior designers. Interior designers were very active in this project. You know, you know they were, you know, a lot of it, you know, was, and so, um, uh, you know, we do a lot of tall buildings, okay? So uh, people know, uh, you know, some, sometimes you have to give the right of way. To, you, you, you're concerned about what's, who gets the right of way, what's more important? 
And one of the reasons that like, I like uh, giving a, a conceptual name like the, the buttress core, it helps you sort out conflicts. It tells you what's the essence of this thing. Now, other things we can modify, but there's some things you can't or you shouldn't. And, and so, uh, and, and we, we had like uh, two rules starting on at the very beginning, which was uh, no transfers. All the structural elements had to line up from top to bottom. You couldn't move sideways. Uh, and number two was uh, stay on module. <laughs> uh, there's a joke that SOM, my company, uh, Skid Martin's Merrill, SOM means stay on module, okay? Uh, you know, so, so, so we, we had a nine meter module. And so that was a very rigor that, that, that cause you, you know, if everything can change, you'll never finish the project, it's too much. And so, no, this is very much, you know, the, the architects and the engineers, uh, you know, we're you know, like, you know, hand in glove. I mean, uh, you know, uh, we sit together. Uh, you know, you, we, we, you know, we, we, we go to the coffee machine together. We, uh, you know, uh, you know, we socialize together. So, um, you know, there, there's this continuous interplay and we do many projects together. And so, uh, you know, it was like, okay, you know, and my, uh, my principal, uh, and this is also true for the mechanical engineers the, and the electrical engineers, the plumbing engineers and interior designers, and, uh, uh, urban designers. Uh, anyway, so, um, you know, so, you know, uh, let's go. Let me go back to the problem where the uh, uh, where the building didn't work at the beginning. Okay, so uh, I, I got the raw data from the wind tunnel. And I started studying the data, and then I could start making interpretations. I look. I was looking at both the uh, the uh, kind of the uh, it's, it's kind of like a, a mechanical impedance plot. It's kind of a mechanical engineering thing. Uh, and so I was looking at that. And I was making interpretations. I was looking at the climatic uh, data at the same time. And, and so, you know, so the engineers, and the architects, and the wind engineers got together and we got together. We said, okay, we need to rotate the building 120 degrees because it's, you know, there's certain, certain wind directions. And, uh, and, and we need to turn and, and we need to change the setbacks used to go counterclockwise. We need to change them to clockwise. And, and, we, need to, and we need to keep modifying the floor more. And so then the architectural team took that and, and work with that. And, and then, you know, you know, they would show us and we, you know, we, would, we would comment, but you know, they laid out the floors uh, based, on, based on their input. And, you know, in a, in a tall building, you know, I talked about the wind thing, the single most important structural parameter is the architecture. Uh, what you architects call the massing, the shape, absolutely critical. So, so the reason we were able to go so tall is because the architectural massing was was responding to the structural demands, and 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 it actually makes the building more interesting. It it it, it had it, no way was the architecture diminished; it was actually enhanced. Um, you know, you know, you know, um, by, by this process. And so, uh, and, and when you end up with a building like that, like the bridge, and, and when you're in super tall. Everything's got to be humming, okay? You, you know, you you, you got to be, uh, you know, there, there is no room for um, for uh, you, you know having you know subpar systems. You know, all the systems have to be right at the edge because you know they're very expensive and and and, and you can't be wasteful. Uh, and, and so you know, so but but you also have to compromise. Not not every individual system is totally perfect. Uh, you know, the, you know, because because you have to know that when when you can give to help solve one of the other disciplines problems uh, and, you know, and, and this whole thing about, you know, the, the core designing the core, you know, the architects just did the first pass did not work for us structurally. And so we re redesigned, but we, we didn't we didn't know, all, you know, we didn't know all the things the architects knew. And so we, we, we gave them our sketch and said, that doesn't work. And, but they saw what we were trying to do and they redraw it. And this went on for, I would say, over a month, maybe two months, I don't know, at least six weeks, this design or a proposal, counter proposal between the architects and engineers. And the most important thing is mutual respect. You know, you know mutual, mutual respect and also do not underestimate the creativity of your collaborators. Um, you, know, you, know, you know, sometimes we, we would say, well, you know, yeah, we could do this, but could, could you solve it on your side? You know, 
And I, I let them go back, go back, and then, and then you can say, well, we can solve it structurally or we can start solve it architecturally. And then, you know, and then what's best for the building? And so, anyways, so but it's a very important point, particularly for students, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, and if you if you go into firms where you're different consultancy, say you're, you're a firm of only engineers or a firm of only architects, uh, you know, somehow develop relationships, even though you, maybe you don't get to go to all the meetings or something like that. And if you're if you're an integrated firm, really interface with your other disciplines. You know, and it has to be a personal thing, not just you know where where you. You know, you're learning from them, and and, and you know, after a while, you know, uh, uh, you know, engineers can propose architectural solutions, and architects can, can propose, uh, you know, uh, structural solutions because they've seen so much, they understand it. They're not just doing what they've been told; they know why this is so, and you learn that from your colleagues. Thank you. Hello, my name is Basil Smal a fourth semester civil engineering student. Uh, first of all, it's a great honor to be a part of this great event. And uh, my question is that, as you have said, uh, Burj Khalifa's different cross sections never allows the wind to organize. Um, what are some other ways to configure a tall building without the wind forces resonating in its natural frequency? Okay, uh, that was all, could you say it again? I'm going to get closer to the mic this time. Um, like, uh, as you have said, uh, Burj Khalifa's different cross-section never allows the wind to organize. Uh, what are some other ways to configure a tall building without the wind forces resonating in its natural frequency? Well, you know, um, th th there's the two sides of it. There there's the, the, there's the, uh, the input variable, which is, you know, your, your input force, which is the wind, and then there's the structure. So, so you, you can play with both or the dynamics, you know. So you have stiffness, mass, mode shape, or, or you know. So so you can play with your structural properties, and you can you can play by shaping the building. You can play with your wind forces. Now you can have holes go through the building. You know, if you have a hole go through the building, then the wind will short circuit through the building. You can have eroded corners. Sometimes you may just have a big shape. That has big forces, but it has, if it has high levels of mass, uh, or uh, part of it has to do is um, at what wind speed do you go through natural resonance? Okay, if you if you uh, if you have a very small floor plane, uh, the wind speed that will cause natural uh, natural resonance may be a low wind speed, so that. So that it, it may be a concern for uh, occupant comfort, but is not a, not a concern for, for structural forces. Uh, here's a little bit of a bad example. I used to have a, 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 a 1966 Ford Custom 500, okay? It was a six-banger with a, a three-speed shift on the, on the column. Anyway, the, 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 the wheels were out of alignment, okay? And so when I would drive, when I get up, I'm sorry for the US units, I get up around 50 miles an hour, the thing would shake like this. But when I went up to 70 miles an hour, it smoothed out because I went to the other side of resonance. And so you can do that in a tall building. You, you can play with the, uh, the shape and then the, the tune. Sometimes you want your building to be softer, not stiffer, depending on, on, on when, when you're going through the natural uh, resonance. And, and then the mass helps. You can also put damping devices in there. Uh, the Burj Khalifa does not have a damper, but we left room for one in case we need, or we figured out how we could add one if we needed to. Uh, uh, and because uh, as an engineer, you need to like, uh, not be too conservative, but ask yourself, well, what if mm, this isn't quite right? Uh, that, that, you, that you have, um, you haven't, as they say, painted yourself in a corner you can't get out of. And, and so, um, you know, all, all the data told us that we did not need a damper, uh, but it was a pretty tall building, okay? Uh, so, uh, so, so we figured out a way that one could, could construct one if one needed to, and you could bring it up through the, through the, through the, the freight, elevator, freight lifts, service lifts. Um, the, uh, but, uh, but in the end, uh, it, it, we didn't need them, so, all right.
So, but part of it is doing lots of wind tunnel testing and, uh, and, and don't just let the wind engineers tell you the answer, get into the data, uh, you know, uh, analyze the data yourself. Uh, anyone else? Uh, sir, I have a question. Yes. I'm uh, Joy from Computer Science Department. I'm not a civil engineer, but uh, I have some, because I've seen the video of uh, uh, the Burj Khalifa construction stuff, really amazing work. Uh, the, your, your contributions were really amazing. Uh, very excited to hear the entire conversation. Uh, sir, actually, uh, see, as per the, the height, you know, uh, the water is not pumped to uh, the top level uh, in one attempt, right? It is going to the different stages. So that means you have a, a different tanks in different, different levels, right? In there, if there is a, a heavy wind, so what happens? I think uh, I've seen uh, there is a swing in the entire structure. Suppose if a vessel is having a water, uh, which is, uh, if I move that vessel, there will be a uh, there is a force will be act, acting on that uh, right so how it is managed in the, in the entire structure so because of the swing there is a possibility uh, more uh, pressure in the uh, the swinging side so how it is managed how it is not um, well you, you know i mean though uh, actually sometimes not in this building but there, there are buildings around the world where they have what they call sloshing dampers where they actually use water tanks that slosh back and forth to dissipate energy, they put baffles in there. But um, the Burj Khalifa is a very quiet building and has a very long period, 11 seconds. So it moves very slow. You actually, the, the Willis Tower moves a lot more than the Burj Khalifa. Uh, you know, the, uh, and so, um, you know, the, the Burj Khalifa, and so, you know, uh, and, and you can look and you can you can calculate the harmonics of the tank. Uh, and, and it's actually kind of difficult to get the harmonics to, to match uh, 11 second period. I mean, you'd have to have certain proportions, which are you're not going to have in a normal water tank. And, and so you, you, and, and, and so the, and the amount of movement is pretty slow. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, uh, this is this building is a very, very pure beam. Uh, in, in, a, uh, in a lot of buildings, which like say beam, like they have a moment frame with columns and beams, you get, you get, you get a lot of like we call it shear racking. Um, but in the Burj Khalifa, except at the setbacks, uh, there's almost no shear racking at all uh, because it, it's, you know, you have all these walls. And so you, your shear deformations are tiny. And so, you know, you don't, you don't get, Near is, it's really one of the most benign buildings in the world, tall buildings, you know, as far as, you know, it's really um, quite, uh, you know, in, in the end, uh, also, uh, by the time we did all the reshaping, the wind force is really quite modest, uh, even though it's so tall. So uh, it's got, a, got a, a very gentle period, uh, you know, and, and uh, and, and, and for that reason, you know, a lot of these issues are not issues. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Baker, it's already 8 uh, 15. I mean, uh, we have uh, passed 15 minutes than the time limit. So, is it okay for you to continue for five more minutes so that our students can ask a few more questions? Yeah, I'm fine. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I'm afraid I, I went a little long. I always keep my watch next to me, but I, <laughs> I, I, I talked a little bit more than I, I intended to. That's fine. So if there's any more questions. Yeah. Yes. And, 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 you know, and, and quite frankly, if, if somebody has any personal experiences they'd like to share, you just drop me a note. Or, or you, you can send it to the organizers and they can, they can send it to me. Because I'm always looking for feedback. I mean, we do have we, the building's instrument up, but still, I like to hear you, human feedback also. Okay. So, um, yes, we have a question from Mansoor. Or Ali?
Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, hi, Mr. Uh, I'm Ali Hussain. I'm a sixth semester civil engineering student. Um, and thank you for uh, uh, taking out your time and talking with us on such a wider topic. So basically, my question is, um, it is uh, well known that uh, high-rise buildings indeed have a lot of benefits uh, that are associated with it. But recently, I came to know from various new news outlets that a uh, country like China has ca uh, capped the height of the high-rise buildings in an effort to protect the local culture and uh, enhance the spirit of the city. So also, I went through some of the uh, scientific studies on the, the, that document, the sociological impact of high-rise buildings on the people and the culture. So wh what do you think on this? Like, uh, should the concerned authorities should correlate the projects with the human's need, humanitarian balance, and low impact on biosphere? Uh, yeah, let me, um, uh, let me speak to that a little bit. Um, the Burj Khalifa is, is a different um, situation because you're creating an event, okay? Just like the Eiffel Tower is, you might say the Eiffel Tower is a very expensive way to make a restaurant. Uh, you, you know, you know it, it, it's more of a creation of a place. That's what the Burj Khalifa. Uh, in general, density is good for um, for the environment because you know, people live close to the, they they live and they uh, um, close to where they uh, where they work or where, where they, they they shop and the like. <clears throat> uh, you know, the Sears Tower has uh, 100 acres. Okay. I'm not, Let's see, divide that by 2.5 to get the hectares. I guess 40, 40, uh, 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 40 hectares of floor plate on one city block. You know, versus being in the, in the suburbs where everybody has to drive to it. You know, uh, if, you're, if you're in a, um, if, you're, if you're out in, the, in a low rise building and you drive to work, uh, the size of your parking space is bigger than your office, okay? A, a typical parking spot is about 27 square meters, which my office is not 27 square meters. Okay, uh, and, and so there's you know so 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 that's part of it. Now, in China, the uh, the the limit is still pretty high. It's like 500 meters, uh, which is you know it's taller. Than, you know, and, and that was kind of done. I think was just because they were like a little. Uh, that was done by the uh, the premier. I think it was just because. Uh, Part of it, uh, there was a bunch of silly buildings going up, and and so I think it was more more done for that point of view rather than any, any other cultural things because uh, I do I do a lot of buildings in China. Um, I think I've got uh, I just finished a 530 meter tower in, in China. I got two 500 meter towers under construction now. I'm doing a competition for another 500 meter tower um, right now, uh, and so they're they're very much into it. Uh, so, so the limitations in China were more about China trying to calm the market down, if you will, and uh, and also there was a lot of, I would say, frivolous designs going up. Uh, they're, they're they're perhaps not. I think they're becoming more carbon conscious than they were. Uh, you know, their 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 pro performers were, were a little bit more generous than what you might have in Dubai or Europe or or the U.S., where developers are more you know, serious, <laughs> or, or the margins are smaller or something, or the cost is, is higher. Um, so uh, I, I think I think that's, that's, that's part of it. But I, I do think density is good. Uh, and, and, but it doesn't have to be that tall, you know. Quite frankly, 30 or 40 story buildings, you can get a lot of density, okay? Uh, you know, if you go up to, you know, there's a lot of density in Dubai, if you go up to uh, the marina, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of density there, okay, um, and, and you know, and it, it it's really about getting people where they're where they're, where they're not in automobiles. They're taking mass transit, or they don't have to take mass mass transit at all. They can walk uh, to where they shop and where they work, and you know, from where they live. And, and, and so, so that that's a that's a big part. Uh, um, before, before we wrap up here, let me just throw in one thing there for um, for since there's a lot of students here. I was reminded by the last speaker who's, who's, who's sixth semester, is uh, uh, one of the most powerful things a student has is the ability to be poor, okay? You guys are used to being poor. You have, you know, living without any money, okay? And the advantage of that, you have freedom. Uh, you know, I, um, 
after I graduated, I, I went to work for a while, uh, but, I, but I, I, did, I didn't change my lifestyle. And because of that, I could go back to graduate school or I could change my profession or whatever I wanted to do because I had not picked up a lot of debt. I hadn't like you know, bought fancy cars or fancy houses and, and, and where I no longer had the freedom to change my mind of what I was going to do in my life. And so when you're young, try, try to maintain your freedom as long as you can. So, so if, you, if you decide you want to you know, change your profession or, or, or change your focus, you, you have the ability to go back to school and, and do that. You're not, you're not encumbered where you, where you have to, you have to keep working just to pay your debt. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is uh, if you're going into structural engineering, you really need a graduate degree. Um, you know, you, you just can't get enough education. And even a master's degree is a little bit on the light side. Um, you know, uh, I, as I said earlier, um, I worked for four years, uh, not in structural engineering for an oil company, yeah, but I wanted to get back into structural engineering. But I did work a little bit on the periphery of structural engineering, kind of as an owner's rep on some construction. And, uh, and the, the thing I learned from my working is that I didn't know anything. My biggest takeaway from my four years is that I didn't know anything. And so uh, when, I, when I went to graduate school, I, 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 I was... I first took all the classes I needed for getting a master's, and then I spent a whole another year just taking more classes, because I knew it was unlikely I was going to go back to school again. And that second year of getting that extra depth of knowledge, if I hadn't done that, I probably would not have done the Burj Khalifa. Okay, so um, um, and, and I have to say, theory is practical. If you're going to, if you're going to design something that's never been done before, you, you need to know. The fundamentals of engineering mechanics. So uh, I'm a big I'm a big supporter of uh, of understanding the theory because uh, you, uh, we now live in the computational age, and and all you all you uh, particularly your engineers here, uh, when you I it's well, it's been over 40 years since I graduated. 40 years from now, what is the world going to be like for you? Uh, we're going to be in the post computational age. Right now, you need to know how to do the computer. And, you know, Rhino and Grasshopper and all that good stuff, all the fine analytic programs. But towards the end of your career, you, you, what it's going to be about is your ability to interpret, your ability to understand what, what it is the computer is telling you, that, that, that you, you can see what's happening because you have the knowledge, the ability to interpret. And, 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 that, and, that is, and that's the stuff that, that's not going to have a shelf life, is your fundamental understanding of engineering. Uh, okay, so that's that's my little soap top, soapbox there at the end. Hi, I'm Sheha, sixth semester BTEC civil engineering student. Mr. Baker, here are many structural engineers listening to you today. We highly value your knowledge and wisdom. I want to ask you, what one advice would you want to give us, the civil engineers pertaining to our careers, networking or academics? And what have you done extraordinarily during your academics, which took you to this height? You talk, you talk about uh, essentially school versus work. Is, is that the question? The, the academy versus the, the practice? Is that your question? Sorry? Academic or networking? Well, um, so engineers pertaining to a career. I think I understand the question, but I, I, I may not actually answer your question because I'm not quite sure I understood it, but here goes, okay? Um, you know, I think it's, I think you're asking about the academy versus practice. Uh, uh, by the academy, I mean, uh, you know, the, the re research world. I, um, I, I am I'm always involved in research, 100% of the time. Mm. I, I had a two hour research call this morning well, where we're trying to invent a new ways to design grid shells. And also, uh, if you really want to learn something, try to teach it. The professors can really attest to that. Uh, you, uh, okay, if you think you know something, write a paper and you'll, you'll find you got all these holes. Try to teach it. You'll find out you really don't understand it until you try to teach it. And so, so that's part of it. But, uh, 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 and, and it's really good to... to but also practice is very important because then you, then you get grounded into what matters. So I think uh, doing both is important. 
I had a feeling that wasn't your question, but go ahead and ask again if if <laughs> if, if you have a if you want to say it a little bit differently. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Baker. That was marvelous. I'm sure we have learned so much in the time we've been here. And it's time to wind up. I request Professor Susan John, Faculty Coordinator, AC Student Chapter, to deliver the concluding remarks. Ma'am. Thank, thank you, Dr. Surami. On behalf of the School of Engineering and IT, Mahe Dubai Campus, and of our AC Student Chapter, I would like to extend our deepest gratitude to Mr. Baker for your enthusiastic participation. It was a very instructive and illuminating talk indeed. Your years of experience, depth of understanding and expertise in the design of tall buildings are certainly a source of motivation to all the faculty and students here today. I would also like to take a moment to thank Ms. Stephanie Wagner, Executive Assistant at SIM, for her support throughout the planning and organization of today's event. My heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Jason, Academic President, for his support and presence here today. My sincere thanks to Dr. S.K. Pandey, our Dean, for your continued encouragement. Lastly, we are very grateful to all who are present here today for being such a wonderful audience. Hope you had a great time tonight. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye.